Well, thank you so much uh, for uh, that, David, that, that kind introduction. And um, it's a real honor and uh, privilege to be with you here today. I'm, I'm very conscious that I'm the last person standing between you and lunch, so I promise to be brief. Soft power can sometimes be something of an ab abstract concept to grasp. So I thought it might be useful if I were to base my contribution today on my time in Russia, where I spent three years from 2005 to 2008, working directly in the soft power space as the director of the British Council in St. Petersburg. The first thing I'd say is that the demand for what we were offering was huge because the people of St. Petersburg were hungry for contact with the rest of the world. And they saw, saw our English language teaching and cultural relations work as pathways to a better future for themselves, for their families, and indeed for their country. This was soft power in action. It was the magnetic attraction of the English language and British music, literature, science, and the arts, combining to draw the rising stars of Russia into the gravitational pull of the best of what Britain has to offer to the world. But it's very important to note that our work wasn't based on an export-led promotional model. All of our projects were generated through partnership with Russian schools, universities, and cultural organizations placed firmly at the heart of program design and delivery. We opened our heart and minds to the people of St. Petersburg, and they reciprocated. This was soft power in the form of cultural exchange, with all parties truly listening and learning from each other. And as such, I would argue that it was far more effective than the more in-your-face, one-way street approach that governments sometimes take when it comes to soft power. Tragically, the Russian authorities forced us to close the British Council in St. Petersburg in 2008. We had become a football in the political and diplomatic meltdown in bilateral relations that followed the assassination of, of Alexander Litvinenko and following a relentless campaign of bullying and intimidation by the Russian security services, we were left with no choice but to shut our doors. The sadness that I felt when I left Russia in 2008 was mixed with a strong feeling of trepidation about the future, as my first-hand experience of dealing with the Putin regime had left me in no doubt about its ruthless determination to dominate and crush anyone or anything that stood in its way. But what my time in Russia also taught me is that Putin's supposed show of strength was in reality a manifestation of his fundamental weakness. Because there's a direct connection between the Kremlin's attack on the British Council in 2008 and its assault on Ukraine in 2022. And that connection is fear. Just as Vladimir Putin was frightened of the soft power of the British Council, as we went about our daily business of engaging with young Russians and opening their hearts and minds to the world, so he is also terrified by the prospect of a democratic, prosperous and vibrant Ukraine on his doorstep. And because people like Vladimir Putin are fundamentally paranoid, weak and insecure, they are only capable of one response when they come up against the subtle and yet overwhelming forces of hope, ambition, and openness, which are at the heart of soft power. They lash out and they seek to dominate and to destroy. At first glance, the standoff between the British Council in St. Petersburg and the might of the Kremlin, or the war between the Ukrainian resistance and the seemingly overwhelming firepower of the Russian army, may look like battles where there can only be one winner. But whilst hard power may win the battle, soft power will always win the war. For more than 30 years, the Russian people have been able to travel freely and have had access to culture and information from around the world. And by and large, they like what they see. They are attracted to freedom and democracy because human beings are hardwired to strive for empowerment and self-determination for themselves, for their families, for their communities, and for their country. My time in Russia left me in no doubt whatsoever that the overwhelming majority of Russians are normal people who want Russia to be a normal country that is open and connected to the world. And my Russian friends tell me that President Zelensky's 
dignity, courage and defiance have given him a reach far beyond anything that President Putin can ever hope to achieve. And in the end, it is the power of persuasion, the power of attraction and the power of constructive engagement that will always win the day. Before closing, I also wanted to say a few words about what the British government needs to do if it is to bolster and strengthen its soft power. And like every politician worth his salt, I have a five-point plan. First, show, don't tell. Conservative ministers have developed the profoundly irritating habit of banging on about how Britain is world-beating at this or that. But somebody needs to tell them that every time they do so, they are in fact diminishing, not enhancing, our soft power. Humility and modesty are far more attractive than bragging and boosterism. The trick is to project a sense of quiet confidence and understated pride in our national story, as opposed to ramming our achievements down the throats of others. Second, innovate. Yes, television series such as The Crown, Victoria, Downton Abbey, Call the Midwife are huge commercial hits, but they're all about the past. I worry that our soft power and national brand appear to be increasingly based on our history as opposed to our present or our future. Britain is not a museum. It's a dynamic, creative place with all sorts of cutting edge things going on across our creative industries. But we appear to be increasingly drawn to playing it safe in the identity and image that we're showing to the rest of the world. Third, educate. Our higher education sector is the beating heart of our soft power, attracting as it does millions of the brightest and best from across the world. This is truly a win-win for Britain, as many students choose to stay in the UK after they finish their studies, thus contributing to our economy and enhancing our cultural diversity. Whilst others return to their home countries, where they often rise to prominent and influential roles. Fourth, invest. Soft power is fundamentally based on trust. So it takes generations to build and it can only take seconds to destroy. Institutions such as the BBC and the British Council have made huge and invaluable contributions to shaping and projecting our country's soft power. But the current government appears to be intent on with withdrawing its support for them. This is the very definition of a false economy and a policy rethink is urgently needed. And fifth, avoid the hard sell. Soft power is at its most effective and durable when it's based on mutuality. Nobody wants to be told incessantly how great or world-beating we are. Far better to build trust and mutual respect by listening rather than lecturing. The message has to be, engage with our culture, learn our language and come to our country because, not because we think we're the greatest, but because we are just as fascinated by you as you are by us. Ladies and gentlemen, my experience in Russia is what convinced me to stand for office. Because my time there taught me that freedom and democracy are precious and fragile things. It helped me to see that for far too long we've been profoundly naive and complacent about the dangerous forces and motives that are driving the behavior of authoritarian rulers around the world. And it made me realize that for far too long we have taken our democracy and our liberty for granted. And we have allowed the autocrats, the populists and the nationalists to undermine our values and to chip away at the foundations of the international rules-based order to the point where it is at serious risk of crumbling to dust. Putin's invasion of Ukraine on the 24th February was a Rubicon moment and there can be no turning back. The world's democracies must now unite and we must pull every single lever that we have at our disposal to defeat those who despise our values and who seek to do us harm. And there can be no doubt that soft power is just as important as the economic coercion, military deterrence and political pressure that, now, that are now rightly being deployed against the Kremlin. Because in the long term, attraction and persuasion will always triumph over coercion and destruction.
It was soft power that won the Cold War, and it is soft power that will bring about the downfall of Vladimir Putin and his barbaric regime. Ladies and gentlemen, I will never forget the hunger for engagement, learning and opportunity that I saw in the eyes of the young Russians with whom I worked in St. Petersburg. And in these dark days, it is that hunger for change that gives me hope. Thank you.